Mosque. It says, Big old, bigger than Michael Moore, bigger than George Bush's ears. Now, I have no idea what that note was about. <laughs> No idea. I, I, I came to you from a, a uh, Muslim convention in Hayward, California, which I'll be returning to after I leave you. Uh, so I, I flew all night. I need to make all these excuses in advance. You already know about the teeth. It comes from driving in Borneo where the steering wheel is on the wrong side of the car and they drive on the wrong side of the road. So it takes so much concentration to adapt to these uh, adjustments that you couldn't possibly watch the road. <laughs> so I ran into a tree, fortunately at, uh, at a slow speed. But all, all the teeth came out. I apologized to the tree and I said, you can keep the teeth. <laughs> Hello, you're from all over the country, I hear. Yes? Okay, it's, it's, it's really a privilege to have time with you. And, uh, and I want to tell you that on the other side of the country, uh, the Muslim population is doing just fine, and they're just wonderful people. And, and glad to be in California as we all would be, I, I think. Um, I, I guess I'd better tell you that I'm a little shaky from, from flying all night long, so I, I'll work from notes for your protection. I can actually ad-lib for eight or 10 hours at a stretch, and you don't want that. So I'm gonna control what I say by looking at these notes. Uh, our form of schooling was designed about a hundred years ago. It is not the timeless form that uh, that teacher college textbooks say it is. It was quite consciously designed about a hundred years ago and quite consciously to prevent the development of independent thought. That sounds awfully creepy, and it probably is awfully creepy, but the people who did this thought that they were obeying not God's will, but evolution's will. Darwin and, and the Darwinists had already established that about 95% of us are evolutionary dead ends. So we got in the way of the good breeding stock and we had to be occupied in, in uh, ways to keep us out of their hair and, and trouble. I know how strange that sounds, but I want to raise my right hand as a believer and tell you that six years ago, I was invited to speak at a global convention at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco. It was called the Sixth Annual Bionomics Conference. It was sponsored by the Cato Institute, some big time think tank in Washington, D.C. And the subject was how to take control of evolution and get rid of the deadwood. That means us. Uh, <laughs> Now, I went out of curiosity partly, and partly because I determined to smuggle my cat into the Mark Hopkins. I never could have afforded the Hopkins without the Cato Institute, and I said, I'm going to get my cat in there for a good deal, too. And it worked fine. The final speech at that conference, this is San Francisco, not more than six years ago, said that we've got to turn up the stress on ordinary people because that discourages them from breeding. Once again, right hand up as a believer. Uh, I couldn't believe, though, that I was sitting there in the 1990s and listening to this, one speaker after another, working out ways to discourage you from reproducing. Uh, anyway, so our former schooling was designed deliberately 
to prevent the development of independent thought. That's an extremely easy mission to accomplish. And I'm gonna show you one way that it is accomplished, and I hope nobody in the room is guilty of this way. The short answer test, with its fixation on disconnected bits of data, can be regarded as a training laboratory in which the ability to think in contexts is surgically removed, while at the same time, certain useful habits like concentration on sound bites and fact bites is installed. If you think of the divide and conquer principle, which Julius Caesar perfected to prevent the formation of alliances among the Gauls dangerous to himself, short answer tests and the habits that must be developed in reading and memorization to do well on them are a way of dividing the mind from its innate ability to think in complex wholes. Only men and women practiced in complex thinking, which cannot be reduced to bits of information, can ever challenge the status quo successfully, and who would want employees like that? If you can only think in fact bits, like a quiz show contestant, if you can only think in fact bits, you aren't likely to cause any manager, whether political or industrial, to lose much sleep. Short answer tests also degrade the teaching business into a trade by regulating what teachers have to concentrate upon if their students are to have a chance to do well on those tests. Short answer tests effectively foreclose a student's need to read and think for himself or herself. He need only read what he is told and think of the answer that's going to be required. What is being tested actually is obedience and memory, not the quality of mind. Now, I don't have a mind good enough to think of that myself. Let me tell you what the source of the ideas I just communicated to you are. In 1898, that's 106 years ago, Cambridge University in England came to this conclusion and decided to segregate, compartmentalize their degrees into first class degrees, second class degrees, third class degrees, and ordinary degrees. If you're the kind of person who wants to walk out of Cambridge with your degree stamped ordinary, then uh, you'll probably approve of that method. However, the short answer test, although it could be given and continued to be given at Cambridge, no longer counted for the first, second, and third class degree. It was utterly irrelevant whether you scored 100 in every single short answer test you took at Cambridge. Wasn't irrelevant to the ordinary degree, but a first, a second, or a third could only be demonstrated by showing the quality of your mind in an essay that displayed not only grace in writing, but original uh, synthetic ability to draw conclusions. Isn't that interesting that that happened 106 years ago, that all of our lives are infested with short answer tests, what are they called, the high stakes uh, uh, standardized testing, and yet that little scrap of information I came across in an obscure book written for professional academic managers and never in any other uh, source that I had encountered, and I have, I am ashamed to say, 
probably have consumed more books about education than any sane human being in the world. I've been reading them now for 13 years at the rate of at least one a day, and often many more when I have whiskey nearby. <laughs> So you get an idea how the suppression of independent thought, that's not the only way by far, but since that's a way that's very active and highly publicized at the moment, I thought that's the one that I would bring to your attention. The history of modern American schooling is a history of deliberately prolonged childishness imposed on young people for reasons that its architects considered wholly benign. It was intended to enhance the efficiency of the national economy and of centralized social management. School as we know it, institutional, hierarchical, divorced from experience, divorced from responsibility, teaching low-grade irrelevancies, and even those taught in a fragmented, obsessively competitive way, was constructed to serve very specific purposes, none remotely connected with what any philosopher for the past 2,500 years anywhere on this planet would have thought of as education. Centralized institutional schooling, which the public has been carefully and exhaustively conditioned to think of as interchangeable with the term education, was sold, and not without great difficulty, to a liberty-loving American citizenry about a century ago under the rhetoric of liberal reform. The public was told that it would revamp the class structure, leading to widespread equality of opportunity and income distribution. School, however, has never done what it officially claimed to be doing. Quite the contrary, it has set the class structure in stone by culturally stratifying the population from early childhood and by monopolizing good jobs for its favorites, jobs which it distributes not to the meritorious, but to the best behaved. School has sought with some success to define human value as a quality of paper pencil testing. This clever intrusion into society has lasted just about a century now, not from history's beginnings, not even for 200 years. For just about a century, we've had this peculiar template, and it has produced great wealth for corporations as a product of the efficiency which it bestows upon management efficiency both in labor and in consumption. That's the invisible kicker in a mass production economy. Everybody who's read Marx at all knows about what has to be done to labor, the radical incompleteness of the laboring lives. But what we never pause to think of is the utter necessity when those machines run full time spewing stuff of various sorts out to have the rest of the population utterly addicted to consumption and instantly dissatisfied with what they've purchased. Those of you who own a computer know well <laughs> what I'm talking about. It's urgently necessary that almost immediately upon your acquisition of a computer or a car that you learn that you've made a hideous mistake, <laughs> that there's a master chip out there and it's coming down the line and it's about to obsolete your, your purchase. <laughs> 
If you read Tracy Kidder's uh, Soul of a Great Machine, how many people read that in here? Kidder, I mean, that book's what, about 15 years old? Kidder, Kidder studied the, the production thinking of the people who put the computers out. He says they never release a computer until they already have its successor designed and ready to go. And then they watch the sales curve. And when it, is that an asymptote at the top? I mean, I'm going back 50 years. Uh, when it reaches the top and starts down, they begin to beat the drums. Key columnists release hints that something really good is coming down the pipeline. Of course, when it finally emerges, its replacement is already in hand. Now, I think Kidder won the Pulitzer Prize for that, didn't he? Anyway, uh, so as the 21st century gains momentum, something has gone wrong with this wonderful thought suppression factory. Uh, something has gone seriously wrong, and it's not public criticism of it. The stability of the school institution is facing deadly challenges at the moment, which the media bends over backwards to make sure that you don't get a clear idea of. Uh, in the first place, the enormous expansion of forced schooling has only had a small effect in increasing social mobility. By 1975, it was utterly clear to those in possession of the numbers that there was exactly the same correlation, minus two or three percent, between parent offspring occupations in the huge school system of the late 20th century as there had been in the moderate sized school system of mid-century or in the totally asystematic school system of the pre-Civil War era. In other words, school didn't make any difference at all with all the drums and alarms and rhetoric, it didn't make any difference at all. Now, a very, very famous uh, sociologist with a best-selling book that must be 25 years old called Inequality. Did uh, anybody know, know who I'm talking about? Because my brain, uh, even though I'm 70, it works better than it's working right now. In any case, in inequality, which comes out in the 60s, this famous sociologist said the same thing. He said they'd spent 10 years looking, and school didn't make any difference at all. Whether it was good or bad didn't make any difference. I mean, you're at liberty to reserve judgment on that, but. Uh, but I took this piece of information from a wonderful, wonderful book called The Credential Society by Randall Collins. That's Academic Press, New York, 1979. It's a historical study of education and social stratification. And Collins says, basically, it doesn't make any difference at all. Uh, a slight shift has taken place, however, in the number of prosperous families. That, they did increase. But this was more than counterbalanced by the predicament of the poor, which became profoundly worse as the 20th century advanced. For the vast majority, at 75 percent, nothing happened at all, and on the two ends, Hideous things happened to the poor, and minor improvements happened in the status of the rich. In the last quarter of the 20th century, purchasing power dropped so sharply for middle and working class people that by century's end, it took the income of nearly two adults to buy on the same scale afforded by the wages of one in 1908. That's like boiling the lobster, you know, very slowly so it doesn't realize it's being boiled. Most students and most parents tolerate schooling for one reason. 
in spite of the idealistic rhetoric, they tolerate it because of its promise of good jobs. And this is where the crisis isn't coming, it is upon us. From the perspective of school's clientele, they are increasingly being made aware that this promise is just a lie. School is becoming an intolerable waste of time, expensive in both time and money, because the credentials which school offers are increasingly seen as illegitimate. Any of you sitting there who have a PhD degree uh, will know what I'm talking about, but it's well on the way for all of us. The force gathering to provoke a crisis in familiar American school routines comes from the intense concentration in the schools of India and China on producing an army of highly trained engineers and technicians. This has been ongoing for over a decade now and it explains the apparently overnight emergence of 10 million quite competent engineers and engineering firms bidding for business in world markets, including the markets of the United States. In, in spite of much romanticism about higher status professions, engineers, technicians, and mechanics as a group are far and away the most important profession in industrial society. We could get rid of all the doctors tomorrow and we'd do pretty well, and Cuba's the model of that. But in this kind of a technical society, you couldn't get rid of the engineers, the technicians, and the mechanics without provoking a violent catastrophe. So we might imagine, I think reasonably, that given the nature of the world we've allowed to be built, the technical training would dominate schooling from kindergarten onwards, and that engineers would claim much of the status available. But this hasn't been the case in America, although it has been in China and India. It will soon become clear, according to the Financial Times of London, this article's chilling and it's about a week old if you want to hunt it down, that China and India are about to release not a mere 10 million highly trained engineers and technicians in the world market, but 50 million more in the next 10 years. Very competent, very practiced, technical people. Will they be competitive with our own people? Well, a brief visit to your local Walmart, by the way, that's America's second largest employer after McDonald's, and get ready for this, I heard it on the radio coming over, one out of every eight Americans has worked for Walmart, uh, but, but uh, McDonald's is, probably one out of every six. Uh, a, a visit will reveal the frightening percentage of all the goods sold of all types which originate in China or India. Industrial labor is available there in huge pools for one thirtieth of the cost in the United States. And you say, but engineers aren't factory workers. Of course they aren't, but the adverse ratio persists. Chinese engineers charge on average about $10 an hour compared to American engineers who charge on average $66 an hour. Are the American engineers better than the Chinese engineers? No. Will American labor be competitive with the onrushing 50 million willing to realize so much less for their time as they descend upon nations to tackle the technical demands of a technologized global system. Can a large middle class 
be sustained in the United States if American incomes are reduced to counter this permanent challenge. The capitalist economic theory says that something wonderful called creative destruction will take place. That is, millions and millions of American families will be wiped out, but miraculously, from an unseen quarter, a new form of employment will rise. That is gospel at the Cato Institute. That's Joseph Schumpeter, who's surely one of the handful of in influential academics of the 20th century, creative destruction. So I have read in the last month in the financial press, uh, Investors Business Daily, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times, Forbes, uh, at all, that not to worry, creative destruction is on its way. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> That sounds like a religious notion to me, <laughs> which you take on faith. Nothing wrong with faith unless, unless you have faith that there's going to be dinner on the table next week from some miraculous source. Uh, I was raised to believe God helps those who help themselves. <laughs> anyway, can a large middle class be sustained? No. No, the industrial work can be done at one thirtieth the cost here, and the highly skilled work at one sixth the cost, and there are people lined up to do it, and thanks to our wonderful investment in broadband and all those other great high-speed access things, the people don't even have to come here. A lot of the work can just be sent over and back. If you're in the publishing business, is anyone here in the publishing business? You will realize that the lion's share of typesetting now for books and magazines is overnighted to India, and then it comes back at, you know, a dime on the dollar, and you can't tell the difference unless you're a typesetter, and then you can tell the difference because you have a cup on the street corner. Uh, so, our schooling is now on a collision course with destiny. It was created to release a numbed and dumbed mass on the world. That includes executives as well as factory workers who could be used as human resources, which produces magnificent efficiency in the executive ranks. You can decide to spend people here or there, this way or that way, or you can say, sorry, but creative destruction has reached your, uh, your job. Uh, uh, and it has been our certainly one of our principal secret advantages over the world, but we are now faced imminently with the loss of enormous numbers of jobs that create our middle class, which, which was another secret, I think, of our libertarian outlook, is that we weren't beholden to a, a, a master group. I've visited nearly a thousand schools in every state during the past 13 years, ever since I left school teaching. I don't know of a single one which alerts its student body to their peril, and I say this with sadness, nor have I seen any form of alternative school that alerts these kids to the strange new world they're about to grow up in when they leave school. I don't know a single school that has attempted to devise a strategy, and there are strategies to meet this crisis. The one that's most favored uh, in my own uh, uh, grading system is that of the old order Amish in Lancaster and Wisconsin. They don't raise 
a single kid, not a single kid to have a job. They raise every kid to have an independent livelihood. Used to be all on small farms, but at least 20 years ago, the Amish farmed so successfully that the price of farmland in Amish country got so high that they could no longer guarantee to do that for every kid. So they went into small business. And without computers and without telephones, <laughs> without cars or trucks, they've done so well in it that Johns Hopkins University about five years ago in a book called The Amish from Plow uh, from plow to something or other, uh, are the wealthiest coherent group in the United States. And the biggest problem in the Amish community is that they consider they have a perfect life, perfectly happy, and what are they going to do with all this money? <laughs> They're not allowed to put it out at interest. And that's part of their value system. You don't do that to other people. But here's all this money piling up. One of the things they've done, which I think should intrigue everyone here is, uh, this was always true, but now it can be subsidized, is the Amish take their own children when they arrive at 17, I think, or 18, and they subsidize a year away from the Amish world. They encourage drinking, smoking, running around, driving fast cars. They encourage the people to taste the best in the secular world. Because as an Amish explained to me, we don't want anybody in our community who doesn't want to be here. That sounds perfectly uh, commonsensical. Why would you want anyone around who didn't want to be around? Uh, how many of the Amish kids after the year hell raising go back and live the rest of their lives as Amish? We can almost tell from the tone of my toothless voice. 98% uh, go back after having been subsidized to live the high life in New York and San Francisco. The famous economic thinker Adam Smith suggested at the beginning of his best known book, The Wealth of Nations, that all children have the ability to be profound thinkers. That book was published in 1776, and it's the Bible of the libertarians, the Bible of the conservatives in this country, none of whom I believe ever bothered to read the book. Because <laughs> if they did, they would discover, among other things, that Smith says that all kids have innate genius and the bell curve is deliberately created by the opportunities offered those kids. He said the difference between a street sweeper and a philosopher is only a matter of, I'm quoting directly from Wealth of Nations, habit, custom, and education, not one of genius and disposition. All children, Smith continued, share a talent for curiosity and wonder. All are gifted in conversation. All are very much alike. These are Smith's words. Up to the ages of six, seven, and eight, until some are deprived of fit subjects for thought and speculation. Now, the most controversial thought I hope to leave behind with you is that the cherished childhood that many of us uh, sacrifice quite a bit to protect is a curse on children. It permanently disadvantages them. Nothing on earth such as adolescence ever existed until it was invented approximately in the year 1906 by an absolute lunatic who looked like a lunatic, the founder of Clark University, the school for psychologists, somehow or other, 
I put his name out of my head, and if you know what it is, don't, don't remind me, because he, de <laughs> he depresses me so much. Adolescence was deliberately invented. Would you like a little proof of that? George Washington was considered by his contemporaries to be of average mental gifts, started school at the age of 11. The first subject he studied was trigonometry, but George was a dull boy. At the same age, or one year later, the first admiral in the American Navy, Admiral Farragut, was in charge of his first warship, sailing it from Peru to Boston with the enemy crew below deck allowed to keep their weapons as a noblesse oblige thing. And when the captain appeared on the deck with his pistols, the real captain that is, and went over to 12 year olds, uh, uh, <laughs> God, my, my mind is really very good. Uh, he said that he would be damned if he was going to allow a stripling to command his ship and Farragut said, sir, you have one minute to get below decks or I will have you hanged on the spot and thrown over the side. <laughs> so, uh, closer to our own time, uh, a famous female historian who was the co-author of uh, that huge world history set that the Book of the Month Club for 20 years uh, used as its main premium, uh, Ariel Duran. It was Will and Ariel Durant's. And, and they're extremely readable, and they're grudgingly acknowledged to be, to have some worth by the professional historical crowd. Well, Ariel Durant married Will when she was 13, and they remained happily married for 50 years. So instead of studying uh, freshman algebra, she was studying professional historiography at 13. Now, either Will was some form of sex pervert, or in fact, this hap happy 50 year marriage that was blessed with millions and millions of dollars royalties from their history of the world has a an object lesson there that I wouldn't dare uh, in the modern climate. I wouldn't dare get into. Anyway, nobody who claims to have read Adam Smith ever seems to remember these important ideas. For example, his pronouncement that children are so mutilated by mental deprivation in early childhood that they become, this is a direct quote, not only incapable of relishing or bearing any part in a rational conversation, but they are also incapable of conceiving any generous, noble, or tender sentiment, and consequently of forming any just judgment concerning the ordinary duties of private life. So I spent 30 years in a classroom, always with 13-year-old kids, all, the, the majority of them not only incapable of relishing rational conversation, but incapable of conceiving any generous, noble, or tender sentiment. And according to Smith, the cause of that wasn't that that inevitable biological bell curve, it was caused by mental deprivation in early childhood. And after 30 years of teaching, about midway in my teaching career, I came to the conclusion that Smith was right. And I instantly shifted my 13-year-old mostly Harlem-derived kids from a New York City eighth grade diet to exactly the same diet that I had been offered at Cornell and Columbia, where I took my degrees in seminar courses. It took about 90 days before in a school where people were swinging 
you know, on chandeliers through the building, and you didn't dare bring your car to school because you came out, all the tires would be gone from it, not just one, but all the tires. And the kids would lift it up, about 16 of them. I, I, I went from participating in the culture of that school, right in the middle of Manhattan's Gold Coast on West 77th Street near the Museum of Natural History, to having what amounted to, with slight modifications, but only slight ones, to a college seminar class where people were intoxicated with ideas where they wanted to learn to speak and write convincingly, compellingly, coherently, because they immediately had opportunities to cut school and use those skills or test those skills or develop them further in the outside world. Of course, that wasn't <laughs> the school's policy, uh, and nor was it uh, you know, part of law, but it was part of my policy. The intellectually segregated classrooms of 20th and 21st century forced schooling in America virtually force mental deprivation on most children in their charge on the grounds that this is a kindness to ordinary children. But don't kid yourself, those kids who are called gifted and talented who wiggle their little hand at the end of their wrist are equally deprived. I grew up during the Second World War in a coal mining town on the Monongahela River in western Pennsylvania, and let me tell you that the third grade curriculum in Monongahela was quite the equivalent of the eighth grade curriculum for gifted and talented kids in New York City. So we're dealing with a profound social experiment, he said. <laughs> I didn't think I'd live, I really didn't think I'd live. I said, am I gonna get on that plane in San Francisco at nine o'clock and, and fly to Albany, New York through Newark, for God's sake? Change planes, get up here where I was assured there'd be signs everywhere, that nowhere I went in Troy would I not be directed by arrows to this place. And 45 minutes later, when I called Isaac in a combination of despair and rage, <laughs> anyway, anyway, here I am. <laughs> So the intellectually segregated classrooms of 20th and 21st America force mental deprivation on most kids, sometimes on the grounds that it meets the requirement of one or another theory of child development. If you just went to the libraries, went to the section where all the theories on child development from Piaget to Erickson and all the rest were and burned them, set them on fire, you'd be doing the world a grand, a grand. <laughs> I've never known a child that developed the way any of the stage theories said they developed, and the people who attempted to shoehorn their teaching, or the kids, into those stage theories certainly were paid back, let me tell you. Their lives were not worth living. <laughs> uh, I, I have... Uh, and I, I borrowed this from the London Times. I, I, you, can't, you can't find out what's happening in the United States from any, any American newspaper, including the New York Times. You have to read the foreign press to get some glimmering of what's going on in the world. So from a letter to the editor in the London Times, I learned this, which will give you some idea of the limits of rationality and of generic principles. Uh, if I'm seeing correctly, everyone in this room has more than the average number of legs for a human being. Now, if I can prove that to you, do you promise to open your mind and reserve judgment on the other things I'm going to say, such as adolescence <laughs> doesn't exist, and childhood is over at the age of seven. And if you force it beyond that, you are going to create some kind of mutant horror. Uh, but let me prove it to you. One out of every 2,000 Americans has either 
one leg or no legs. When you add that in and average it, the average number of legs in an American is 1.998. Now, as far as I can see, I'm looking at two-legged people who are carrying more legs than the average. <laughs> I would hope that every time someone uses the term average with you, you would understand that that leads you into an intellectual cul-de-sac. You cannot clearly see if you think about averages. Adam Smith never once claimed that education would lead to national prosperity, only that dividing the people into specialized classes and setting them into competition with one another did. What he did claim for education was that the division of labor would drive people seriously insane even though it was inevitable because it produced so much profit for corporations, he said the only possible corrective is education. If your body and your movements can't be free, education can liberate your mind and make it free, and thence you can live a, a worthwhile life, and you can endure what you have to put up with from your economic destiny. Uh, some of Smith's important contemporaries, even some of his friends, challenged his argument that ordinary people should be allowed to seek education. The economic thinker William Playfair, for instance, who ironically wrote the uh, introduction to the first edition of uh, Wealth of Nations, flatly stated that real education among the public at large would be a roadblock to national wealth. And he was absolutely right. He said, quote, the education of the middle and lower ranks is one of the things that tends to limit the prosperity of a nation, not to enhance it. Playfair wasn't talking about any dangers in schooling because schooling is confined to habit training, propaganda, rankings, confinement, and exhortation. Those are the weapons of mass instruction. He was warning about real education, the development of independent judgment, which arises from an ability to think comprehensively in context, not in bits of information and facts, informed by a knowledge of history, philosophy, economics, political science, natural science, literature, and of course, theology. A proper schooling, said Mr. Playfair, and don't you love the irony of his name, would only teach negatively. That's a direct quote. It would never allow working people to read sufficiently well to understand the words they do read. About 15 years ago, when I became utterly certain that the kids who scored on the top of the standardized reading exams, for the most part, could not read unless their parents were skilled and loving readers. They could not read. They could pass reading tests, but they couldn't read. I devised a, a way of testing whether that hypothesis I had was true. I took a book written in one and two syllable words that's world famous even today and when it was written in 1927, all quad on the Western Front, the chapters are about 1,000 or 1,500 words long. There's plenty of letting between the, the lines to make the book longer so they can sell it for more. Uh, and it's from the point of view of German uh, teenagers. Nothing could be more accessible than all quad on the Western Front. I then devised a test using this cunning Italian strategy. 
remember Machiavelli somewhere hovering in my background here. I studied the type of question that was asked on the standardized tests, and you don't, you don't have to do that very long before you see that there are really only half a dozen types asked. The wording is different, but they're after the same thing in the question over and over again. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that a standardized reading test is seeking six types of information. Well, I knew from my periodic dabbling into the world of linguistics, which you always run screaming away from, but still, I knew that there were approximately 150 types of information in a reading section. And they really are classified. They have Latin names and things. But here, the test was only asking for six, six qualities of information. So I made up a test drawing on types of information that a standardized test didn't ask for, but none of them were tricky questions, unless you think, what's the name of the person telling this story? I mean, if you think that's a tricky question, uh, then I, I was full of tricky questions. <laughs> uh, after two years of applying that test to the gifted and talented children at IS44, Caddy Corner from the Museum of Natural History in New York City, the highest grade on the short answer test that I ever got in two years was 30 out of 100. So I said, to what extent have they actually had blinders built in that they can't see the information? So in the third year, in the fourth and the fifth, I said, it's an open book test. And it's only on the first 10 pages, <laughs> which only have about 220 words on a page. And if I tell you that most of the people in the open book test couldn't get but one right out of 10 questions, and the real stars could get four or five right, I thought I had stumbled across some real form of animal training that's applied over and over again. The sharper the mind, the more it sees that the payoff is in getting the right answer on the test. So what would a sharp mind do confronted with Moby Dick? Would it really struggle with predestination and, you know, God's hand and man's affair? I don't think so. You'd scan for the kind of information that you knew was going to be on the standardized test. And fortunately, since the same information is on over and over again, I mean, you don't have to be too smart to figure out what it is. You wouldn't see the rest of the book. And that I submit to you is what our form of animal training has done to the best and brightest among us. When you see somebody who's an exception to this rule, they are invariably an exception because their parents know how to read or anything else. Uh, you never let an Italian ad lib, or I'll have to ask Jerry to lock the door, we'll be here till midnight. <laughs> Okay, so, so Adam Smith's first biographer was attacked by the British establishment for encouraging ordinary people to learn how to think and therefore to participate in politics. And his biographer, a guy named Dugald Stewart, who was a famous uh, Scottish philosopher, I believe, Stuart said no, he didn't want that at all, that he was anxiously desirous of preventing the danger of such an evil, of allowing ordinary people to participate in the political process. There was a reason that America needed its first revolution, and you've just heard a big part of it, to escape the slavery which ignorance or schooling imposes. And ignorance imposed on ordinary people for many centuries 
back in their homelands and nowhere more skillfully and comprehensively than in England. In the long traditions of the Western world, there are only three morally legitimate reasons to school children at all. The oldest of these is to make good people. Think of that as the religious purpose. Whatever differences religions hold from one another, all preach of some transcendental realm beyond the material. A spiritual essence which speaks to our need for love, for identity, for charity, for courage, and for other eternal human yearnings inexplicable by any science. Reverence for this invisible realm has been a constant across the human record. There's nowhere you don't find it. In secular circumstances, such a state can be evoked through the study of poetry, music, dance, architecture, painting, the contemplation of nature, stillness, and solitudes. A school doesn't have to be overtly religious to celebrate this religious mission, which I'm calling the first purpose. It only needs to acknowledge that rationality has sharp limitations and that people who lead rational lives usually find they're leading hollow, narrow, thin lives. Education, as opposed to mere schooling, is partially about the development of an active inner life that strives <clears throat> for transcendence. So it's independent of any material circumstances. And the book I'll assign you to read, if you haven't already read it, is Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Here, the wealthiest man in the world, the most powerful man in the world, the emperor of Rome, writes a book that's still in print and widely read that says that nothing money can buy or nothing power can earn has any importance at all. That none of it produces happiness, that all of it produces addictions. That to be free, you need to be free of. Well, take it from Marcus. He was the emperor of Rome, and believe me, if he was still the emperor, he'd make you take it. <laughs> uh, the second purpose of legitimate schooling has been widely acknowledged in, in modern times. It's the development of good citizenship. The models for this ideal come out of classical Greece and Rome, where each citizen was thought of as a little sovereignty. One of the uh, interesting packages of information about ancient Greece that's been removed from the record, so you can read endlessly about it and not come upon this, this truly fascinating fact that all public positions in classical Greece, all of them, general of the armies, water commissioner, whatever you name, were selected by drawing the names out of a hat or whatever the Greeks wore, I couldn't draw it out of a, uh, that contained the names of all the citizens in the city state. And if yours came out and it said water commissioner, no one wants to hear, I don't know anything about bringing water to the metropolis. You better learn or you're not a citizen anymore. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but let me tell you where that bit of information is not concealed. At St. Paul's, where the presidential candidate John Kerry went, they learned that when they study ancient Greece. At Andover, where the sitting president went, they learned that. At St. Albans, where the Democratic candidate Al Gore in the last election went, they learned that. At Groton, where Franklin Roosevelt went, they learned that. At Choate, where John F. Kennedy went, they learned that. But I've never seen a public school in the United States where the faculty even has a glimmering that that was once so. Doesn't that 
raise certain speculation about whether it could be so again. While I was laying on the floor of the airport in Newark, trying to, the television, when I was I'm in there at 5.50 in the morning, the television's playing about a little biography of Donald Rumsfeld. That's exactly what I needed to try to get to see. <laughs> but my ear did perk up when it said that after a uh, a long lifetime, I mean, he was well into middle age of always doing government work. Suddenly, he's picked to be the CEO of some technical corporation. They didn't seem to worry. Is it possible that the people who picked him were aware that you don't have to go through 16 years of postgraduate training to learn how to be a CEO? that it's really about managing people. And that the second job he got for Halliburton, he knew nothing about it all, nor had he any prior experience at all. But Halliburton dropped him right in there. Hey, Don, way to go, man. Uh, so so the, this developing citizenship, a citizen was an independent agent who decided independently what was in the community's best interests. It had nothing to do with obedience, and it had everything to do with taking a seat at the policy table. Notice that you cannot do that unless you can speak well in front of audiences made up of strangers or even hostile audiences and unless you can write well and coherently. So if you wanted to eliminate the 95% of the ordinary population, including the, uh, the book world and the journalistic world at the time, so there was some interest in the method which required, get ready for this, that every Harvard undergraduate write a 1,000 word paper every day and not hand the paper into a professor but drop it into an anonymous box in front of the liberal arts building every day. Among the uh, student body there were passionate discussions of what dossiers were being created with this writing that would then open doors or determine uh, ceilings on your possibility to advance in later life. But everyone who went through that regimen became a crackerjack writer. It was only in the early 1960s that someone at Harvard blew the whistle on what was being done. And when I say that, I see a gleam of understanding in your eyes. What was done with those thousand word daily papers was they were instantly taken to the incinerator and burned. The very act of doing it taught everything that needed to be taught. And I'll tell you, after 15 years of running a high-level, intensive speaking program with Harlem kids, that all my input that I felt wonderful about and really, you know, I mean, I probably have it somewhere in, in, in a book, didn't amount to 1% of the incredible advance I saw among these kids that took place simply by having twice a week to go somewhere in New York City and make a public presentation in front of strangers or go back to their own elementary schools and, and make public presentations or direct plays. Anyway, to just exercise the facility, and then the feedback that comes from your audience allows someone who's awake to make changes, and the improvements are natural. And if you have some doubt about that, don't try to tell anybody, or this old bird, that you actually learn to drive by getting a driving 
permit and then having a high school course in driving. When you're out there with the madmen on these Albany freeways, in and out, the swirling, the hundreds of decisions that have to be made, many of which put your life in peril or your health in peril there, and almost nobody crashes. I know there are a lot of crashes, but almost nobody crashes. I read books when I drive, and that's worse <laughs> than drinking when you drive. I, I used to drink when I drove because it was so much fun, but I had several horrible accidents, and in the last one I, I lost my right hip, so I said I, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> so now I read when I drive, and it's much more dangerous. 15 minutes. I, I've been told that I have 15 minutes and that couldn't possibly finish in, in, in 15 hours. So why don't, why don't I let you decide what the agenda will be for that 15 minutes. I should tell you about the third and the fourth purpose though. So let me do that real fast and I'll step away from the, the script. The first purpose, recall, is the religious purpose to make good people. That's by far the oldest and the deepest and the richest. The second purpose comes about approximately at the time of the French Revolution, and that's to make good citizens. Good citizens aren't people who mind their P's and Q's, they're people who can argue effectively in the public marketplace of ideas, that they demand a seat at the policy table. That's who a good citizen is. I've never seen a school that aimed to develop that kind of person. The third purpose, so that's the public purpose. The third purpose, which is the personal purpose, is to take each kid and develop their personal talents or proclivities to the utmost, to bring it to a state-of-the-art thing. Now, there are schools, but there aren't many of them, and they're frequently home schools who, in fact, make the entire curriculum the urges of the kid, and then built into that is an entire intellectual curriculum. Uh, I mean, the, the kid has obligations, but, but the kid determines. Uh, some of the most famous people around uh, were uh, reared that way, raised is the way I want to say it, but I was told in school that was, that was wrong. Anyway. The, the most prestigious scientific job in the world today is the head of the Human Genome Project. That's Francis Collins. And Francis Collins was raised on a remote sheep ranch in Western Virginia, never saw the inside of a school until he was almost grown. And the curriculum was simply this. Collins and his three brothers, the rule the mother laid down was all four of them had to agree on what they were going to study. And then they would study it single-mindedly until, when? Until they were tired of it. And then they would decide on something else. And in this strange zigzag fashion, Francis Collins not only grew up to star at Harvard. Harvard had no trouble accepting him. But he had no trouble rising through the ranks of competitive science to being the head of the Human Genome Project. That was his curriculum. Whatever you feel like doing, you do, but you do it seriously, whatever it is. Uh, the Colfax family, are there any homeschoolers in here? The, the Colfax family in uh, north of San Francisco, it's uh, Boonton, uh, California. It's, it's that high ridge that's above the Pacific, uh, up around Fort Bragg. Uh, terrible land, but beautiful. I mean, to, the, the, he got blackballed for being uh, some kind of a radical college professor. And so he and the wife, and eventually four sons, lived in the back of a car for a year. They put all their money, which was very, very little, and he couldn't get a job. They put all their money in this tar paper shack up in the top of uh, the, the, the mountains. 
and it didn't have running water for like 10 years. I had to go down into a valley and draw the water by buckets. The kids worked around the clock. Seven days a week, they put in 12, 14 hour work days at hard labor. When they arrived at the age of 18, the first one arrived, he applied to Harvard and was accepted on a full tuition scholarship. When the second one arrived at the age of 18, he applied to Harvard and was accepted on a full tuition scholarship. The third kid applied to Harvard two years later and was accepted on a full tuition scholarship. They're all grown men now. No, the fourth kid. And the fourth kid, oh no, you're right, no, no, you're right. And the third kid was a minority kid who'd been adopted by the Colfaxes. And the fourth kid had become a world famous goat breeder up in that mountaintop. He flew around the country carrying his goat under his arm and he said he didn't want to waste his time at Harvard. Now the book you have to demand that your librarian get for you is Trouble in Paradise, which takes you, holds your hand and takes you chapter and verse through how you can work hard 12 hours a day and at the same time get a beautiful classic education and scientific education. Or you can go to Benjamin Franklin's autobiography and find out how a kid working 60 hours a week at the age of 12 can put himself through a curriculum that Yale or Harvard or Princeton wouldn't dream of asking of their freshmen. And not just Franklin, but a friend or two also there. We have been profoundly duped. And we're surrounded by a, a, a pedagogical culture of deceit. We have been tricked into being our own jailers and to be being much less than we could be, that we can be. And at that point, I have nine minutes left, and I, I, I'll, I'll fight to hear. Yes, ma'am, in the... Uh, oh, the fourth purpose is what schools are about today. The fourth purpose comes about through the work of Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller, Vincent Astor, uh, uh, people of that ilk, the fourth purpose is to convert you and your children into human resources which can be spent to make the managerial systems of government and the economy and the military more efficient. And that absolutely works. That's why we've dominated the world in the 20th century. We ask our citizens, without telling them, to sacrifice their lives and to make themselves fit raw material for managerial efficiency. That's the fourth purpose. We got the idea from Prussian Germany and everybody involved in founding American schooling, everybody, John Dewey included, either went to Prussia and studied the system firsthand or they studied under somebody who came back with a PhD. You do understand, of course, that the PhD degree only existed in Germany, not here. That's a German export, and the truth is it's a northern German export, and University of Berlin is the most prestigious manufactory of PhDs. Every government agency in, the, in a span of 30 or 40 years, every government agency in the United States, every college in the United States, there are no exceptions. We're headed by either a Prussian PhD or by someone who studied directly under a Prussian PhD. Dewey studied under G. Stanley Hall, that screwball who invented adolescence and uh, was the uh, president of Clark University. Can we have a couple more questions, Jerry? Please, please, please. We're all too fat. We don't need lunch. <laughs> or those of you who need to be fatter can go to lunch. And
Okay, give us a place, and anybody who wants to sit around, talk, then then I gotta I I I, I got I gotta get to bed, you know. Otherwise, I'll die on you, and then then you'll have trouble for my wife. <laughs> First, again, I'm drawing on my Machiavellian background. The assumption that if you don't study for standardized tests, you'll do badly is absolutely incorrect. By Adam Robinson's uh, oversized paperback book called What Smart Students Know, and you will understand more about how the standardized test is put together. According to Robinson, you don't even have to know the subject to pass a standardized test if you know how the thing's assembled. Adam Robinson, by the way, was co-founder of the Princeton Review, and he charges $300 an hour for, he doesn't do it himself, you know, for his, his lackeys to teach people this. But he told me anything that he knows is in what smart students know. The second thing is, is that homeschoolers regularly do about a standard deviation better nationally than private school kids who do about half a standard deviation better than on the standardized test. My source of information there. And always let your kids challenge you about where, they gotta be polite, but where your information came from. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful brain developer. Uh, there's a, there's a mild-mannered fellow out west who produces statistical uh, studies of homeschoolers and has, what's his name? Brian Ray. Brian Ray, yeah, and he really is mild-mannered mild and rather, and rather harmless in a nice way there. So he doesn't have an agenda other than the fact that he, he loves homeschooling, and I believe he's a religious homeschooler himself. Is that true? Yeah. But I met him a few times, and it's like uh, Sam uh, Blumenfeld. Uh, you know, it's a nice encounter, and, you know. I just want to say that at my school, we had no curriculum and non-compulsory class attendance. My students improved on standardized tests two and a half times the national average. It, it happens because as you educate yourself, and don't believe for a second that anyone can educate you. You take an education. It is not given by anybody. No great school can educate you. It is an act of will to be educated, and it's an act of habit training to be schooled. And you should talk to your, your, your kid about that. That's why when your kid has some passionate interest, no matter how wacky it is, that what's being developed there, that close attention to nuance and detail, uh, it's priceless. Dan, uh, Dan Greenberg uh, of Sudbury has a classic story in one of his 150 books, I can't tell which one, about a kid who did nothing at Sudbury except fish. Nothing. Never went to class. Never was seen with a book. He went down to the lake, and he, they have a lake on their little campus, and he started to fish, and he fished all day long, and then the next day he went and fished, and he fished all day long, and after five or six years, I guess his mother got a little nervous. <laughs> and she said, well, uh, all he knows how to do is fish. And Dan has, I, I'm not gonna spoil the surprise for you, in fact, call Sudbury and ask Dan which of his 150 books that story's in. And Dan goes through the catalog, in fact, of what he's learned about the effect of the number, of the incidence of bites according to the angle of the sky in the sky and the shadows in the water. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Remember, Dan was a physics professor at Barnard College, so he should know. Um, one or two more questions. Anybody? Don't you want to know about the 2,000 Muslims I spoke to? Yes.
decisive often. Yeah, so, what, what I'm actually looking for is that, like, you know, the thing in terms of calculus, the thing in terms of numbers, and I think they actually to, to put, like, I've never seen somebody teach calculus in a real way, right? It's always graphs, it's always Cartesian coordinates, it's always algebra, it's always that. Is there any kind of a, a, a method or something that you know of that you can actually teach that kind of plot? Well, you've heard of the famous California calculus teacher, Jaime Escalante. There was a movie made about him, Stand and Deliver. I'm going to tell you something that was left out of that movie, but first, let me praise Escalante. Not only overweight, but wearing a golf hat, and he has a Peruvian accent, and now he's with the toughest kids in the Los Angeles school district, never ate off a tablecloth, and are ready to fight day after day. So it's an impossible situation. Inside of two years, Escalante's classes were the highest scoring classes in calculus on the advanced placement tests in California, and get ready for this. In the United States, including private school competition, Escalante's classes were number three. Two years from two and two is four to the best calculus class in the country. Uh, what they left out, they show the passion, which I do think is a part of it too. But what they left out is the method that Escalante used. And I happen to have heard of the method from the man who invented it. It was uh, an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who flunked calculus himself three times. And he said to me, I knew that I wasn't stupid and that it was the method that was causing this crossed wire thing in my mind. So this guy mortgaged his home and used the money to create a calculus program that's in widespread use across the United States, but only among homeschoolers. It's the Saxon calculus program. John Saxon was an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who flunked calculus three times. Jaime Escalante, with his passion, applied the Saxon method to a group of uh, extremely poor and combative children, many of them illegal uh, uh, Mexican agricultural workers, and inside of two years, they're number one in California, when we're talking about Beverly Hills and Bel Air and all those places, and number three in the United States, we're talking about Groton and St. Paul's and Choate and Gunnery and Hotchkiss. Uh, I have no interest at all in learning the calculus, although I had the world's foremost structural engineer who I took a course from up at City College. Mario Salvadori was his name, had a whole page in Who's Who. He died about 10 years ago. Say to me, John, I could teach you the calculus in three days, but because you don't believe that, he said, in three years of hard study, you wouldn't learn the calculus. There, he said, it's extremely simple. Uh, Okay, I think we need to, we need to break. Why? Don't we need to talk? I need to go to bed, but I'd rather talk to you. Well, but, uh, it's, we've got 25 minutes to do lunch, and then I think we'll, we'll announce where we can meet after lunch. Where you can talk I, 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 I think by after lunch, Jerry, I'm, as soon as I get up from this table, okay. I, I have to. Yeah, and I'm not insulted if you go to lunch. My wife would go to lunch. Workshop. It's now going to be at 2:20. Um, it's going to go till 5:20. It's going to be open 
What time is yeah, it now? I mean, it was scheduled for three hours, so I'm going to continue to schedule it for three hours. We'll I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, so at 2.20 in here is Pat Ferenga's workshop. Lunch is going to be from 1.20 to 2. So you've, only, you've got 40 minutes. What time is it? It's like 1.15. 1.14. 1.20? Yeah, I mean, you okay. could all go over there like at five minutes before, but it's going to get a little crazy. Um, and then we're going to have a 15-minute closing at 15, minute, 15 minutes after lunch. So from 2 to 2.15, we're just going to all get together in the multipurpose room, do a very quick closing just to wrap up this weekend. And then um, for those of you that are attending past workshops, you can head up here. For those of you that are attending any of the afternoon workshops, you can go to those. Isaac, did you make them uh, that pass out that I express mailed to you? Yeah. Well, can they have it? <laughs> I'll go get that now. How about oh, that? Okay. Yeah. We can't eat in here. Yeah. You look sort of like Debbie Meyer. Did anyone tell you that? That's who I thought you were when I wait. I mean, I'm blind as a bat, but you look sort of like Tim. Angela, I talked to you on the phone. I would, I'm sick as hell. I freaking chucked out here to. Uh oh. That means. Are you doing? I'm not getting too close. Soon, soon I'll be sick. No, no, no. All right, this will be the translation of that one. It's a heavy book. <laughs> Is that the last copy? Is that the last copy? Uh, no, there's more in the How much are they? 25. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we've got to get this scan number. I can't smile at you because I don't have any teeth. It's ridiculous. It was exhausting. So, Daniel, so what do you do with the Muslims? Well, we had about seven or eight hours, so more than I could do with the audience here. I, I tried to give them a perspective against which all the frightening demands of, of the school system swam into a perspective, and then how to avoid the worst side effects of that. I, they're lovely people. That's the third Muslim audience I've spoken in front of. Muslims are they visiting? Well, they're American Muslims in the sense that they're citizens now, but so they live here. They yeah, but they're all from somewhere else. Yeah. And once I spoke to 3,000 in Toronto, uh, so they, I think they hang together for protection, but they're not clannish in the way the press. Uh, uh, describes them. I mean, I, I felt completely at home from the first day. I said, and the women are quite outspoken. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi there, John. David Allen. Um, I, I, well, I can do it again in, when we get back to a public forum, but I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit more about what you were saying about Adam Smith and education as a, um, a correction to the division of labor. That's in the early part of uh, Wealth of Nations. Uh, 
elsewhere in theory of moral sentiment, Smith says that it's extremely useful to society to have accumulations of capital, but you can't accumulate capital, he said, without driving yourself insane and having a rotten life. So we should be grateful to the people who sacrificed their lives to do this because they pay a hideous price in their humanity. That's another thing the uh, the libertarians don't talk about when they when they cite Smith. I mean, they pick out the convenient parts that uh, you know. Yes, sir. Oh, sure. Jerry, where did you get these books? From your distributor. From from Roland? Yeah, from Roland, the guy Roland told us to write. We had to get a case of oh, oh, yeah, listen, will you, if you're going to get them anymore, will you get them from me? Because I donate the proceeds of the ones I give to Roland to the Odysseus well, Roland group. Roland didn't tell us to contact you. He just kind of sent us to the distributor. Yeah, up in New Hampshire or something like that. Yeah. He didn't give us a very good discount either. Well, I will. I know. <laughs> That's where we got our first case. So get them directly from me, and I'll give you a, a decent discount. Pardon? Yeah, could uh, I can stay another 15 minutes, but if you'd sit down until, yeah, because if sure. Could you just sort of let me see the? Okay. How come you don't have your books anymore in Barnes and Noble? I can't find them anymore. Well, if you ask them to order the book, they will. They you just walking in, get two, three copies, send them off. You're the, the senior gift guide every month. The teachers' union uh, exerted some pressure. So they'll they'll order it, but they don't carry it because the teachers' union has threatened to boycott them if uh, if they do. Uh, y yeah, if anybody wants to talk about a particular, yes, sir. Not a loud voice, so you can be heard over the din. Yeah, it, you know, if we had a pitcher of beer and we were alone, I, I would be glad to gnaw on that. Uh, it, it's, it's, no, it's too theoretical. The, the truth is that, that the, the emphasis on schooling and draining the public treasury into the schools not only works against the interests of kids, works against the interests of families and working people. The attention of the government ought to be on full and decent employment. And let me tell you that when people have those needs taken care of, they're much, much more receptive uh, to improving their mental state or their character or whatever. What else does uh, so that mean what? Everybody no, the, see, the difficulty is, and it, as I say, it's a fascinating question, but the difficulty is that that requires days, that requires a conference on that question, and you want to hear everybody's. What I'm not is a medicine man, and you should all feel hostile toward anyone who brings you a list and says, we only did this. The more money you put into schools, the worse they become. I was in 30 years inside those buildings and every time we got a fresh infusion of cash, the situation for kids got worse. Now that sounds like a radical opinion, but let me show you what the mechanism is. What do you spend the cash on other than more intrusions into the kids' thinking time. And the intrusions themselves 
are poisonous. I mean, we have abundant illustrations of people who reared themselves and had splendid educations. Franklin is laying there to be tapped. The Colfaxes are. The more you intrude in a kid's life, the more you say, this is what you need to know to pass the SATs, the more wrecked the kid becomes, the more irrelevant this thing called education is, because there is no correlation, none at all, between school grades or SAT tests and anything in future life. In fact, in many instances, there are negative correlations. The better you do in this area, the worse you will do in, in, in the reality of it. Yes? What do I do in reverse of that in my own education? Oh, what, what, what? Oh, well, no, 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 no. The acoustics aren't great here. I'm saying, what do I do to reverse the damage of my own education? Because I know I have things. Well, we all. We all are in that boat unless we had parents who themselves were liberated from these uh, pernicious assumptions. I've been working at it, I don't know, I guess 40 years, and I'm 70 years old, but, uh, and I'm certainly not where I wish I, I was, but when I look back on the incomplete me's in the past, I'm just aghast. I mean, I entered public school teaching straight out of Cornell and Columbia, believing that the human race distributed itself on a bell curve, that it was a kindness to stupid people not to ask them to think, et cetera, et cetera. I never wanted anything to do with mothers and fathers because they got in the way of, you know, my working day, and slowly, bit by bit, I cured myself of most of that, not before horrible damage wasn't done to my own children. Both of them became national merit scholars, which meant they didn't cost a penny for their college education, and both of them became committed to their happiness from the approval of others on marks of some sort. And nobody's impressed, nobody's impressed the day you step out of school with your marks. And I'll prove that to you, just like I proved that you have more legs than, than average. If there's anybody here who ever hired an engineer or a barber or an auto mechanic or a lawyer and said, I first want to see your standardized test scores, then I will eat these cops in front of you. <laughs> Give me a break. Nobody cares. We all know they're irrelevant. They do not measure or grade uh, in, in, in any way that's useful to anybody. Mirror and say, why do I allow? Why, when they tell me I have to take a standardized test, or my kid does, do I do it? Why don't I say, no? Did you notice two years ago that when the wealthy, wealthy parents of Scarsdale said, we won't take those tests, that they didn't take those tests? Don't take the tests. But don't throw mud at people and call names. Just say, just. Bartleby the Scrivener is my Bible. Do you remember that Melville story? I prefer not to. That's, that's all you have to say. I prefer not to. I'm a, I'm a parent of a, a, a shouldn't be 13-year-old boy, and we're unschooling, and I'm from North Carolina, and we just opted out of the public schools last October. And he was in an international baccalaureate program, uh -huh. And uh, under a lot of pressure, and um, I have just enough uh, understanding about child development to be quite dangerous, but I could observe him becoming quite stressed. Oh, sure. And so we had a meltdown, to make the long story short, and now we're actually, I find that we have like one foot in the old energy and one foot in the new energy, and we're having difficulty integrating. And plus, we're quite isolated in the Winston-Salem, North Carolina, central area of North Carolina. There are very few, I, I mean, three unschooled families in my... Can you talk 
Chuck is an equal with your kid? Yes. yes. Yeah. Well, always bring bring these stresses out in the open and, and discuss them. Do the rest of you know what the International Baccalaureate Program is? I'll bet you don't. It's the same program on a lower level as the Rhodes Scholarships. They were, they are an attempt to create a globalized elite independent of locale, independent of tradition and family, who, people who can manage a global society. You know, they tried to pull one off in the last 10 years, so it's still premature. But the isolation is one of the things that we're having difficulty with as we have jumped from uh, one worldview to another worldview, I guess. It's, we see a homeless land as a lighter way. Yeah. But no, North Carolina is a prominent unschooling state. Don't be so certain, I mean that. Don't be so certain. I work as often for religious homeschoolers as I do for secular homeschoolers. And it's difficult for me to tell the difference among those who are doing it passionately with their heart in it. I, I don't feel the sense of you know, some divine menace when I'm with those people. Well, I, I think that you have your own integrity there, and if you don't wish to do that, then you're going to have to find another, another group. But how far up uh, away from the coast are you? Uh, Asheville? Are you around there? We're actually in the center, in the very center of the state. And so what we're finding is that we're, we're eager. We're, uh, we're actually... How old's the kid? How, how old is the kid? Twelve. Twelve. Perfect. You read David Colfax's and Mickey Colfax is his wife. Trouble in Paradise, and you'll see how a totally isolated family who were really far away from any neighbors managed a, 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 a brilliant life and a brilliant marriage out of it, and their kids are heavily involved now. I mean, I think one's a lawyer and one's a doctor. It, it, does somebody follow the Colfaxes? Uh, anybody? Well, they're heavily involved in urban uh, work and, huh? Is it C-O-L-F-A-X? Yeah. C-O-L-F-A-X. It's unique in a way because he's so articulate. So you can see year by year this process emerging there. And as they say, Harvard is nothing if not cold-blooded about who they take in. So they would not be charmed by the idea that you lived in a you know, in a red mud tar paper shack up on a mountain. Uh, what they were impressed by w was the development, both intellectually and in character, among these kids. Yes, sir. If I were your age and I were contemplating higher education, I would really try to cleanse my mind of the need to go and sit down at a college. You can take a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD from the best colleges in this country by correspondence you can drop in uh, on the college uh, for the summer now and then, and you can go 
at about 35% of the cost of sitting down, and you can complete a degree in about a year and a half. I know a family who you're welcome to call, but you'll have to call information. The Swan family, S-W-A-N-N, I believe Joyce is the mother, in Salt Lake City, they have, I know it's gonna kill some people here, they have 17 kids, every single one of them had a college degree by the time they were 18, and several had master's degrees, and one had a PhD by the time, not from some cow college or podunk either. Now, I may be exaggerating, she has at least nine kids. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, loud, 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 so everything I value what you have to say about schooling, but I, if I heard you correctly, at the beginning of your talk, you said something entirely new and different than I've read in your books, which is that you see economic catastrophe is not only on the horizon, it's weeks, months away. It's already upon us. It's upon us. Yeah, it's upon us. Uh, because we're in a remarkably consumptive economy, and we're all going to stop being producers and simply be consumers. Right. Right. So take me a step or two further than that. Well, I tried to when I when I offered as an example of where you can go from thinking of your life's work as what someone else tells you to do. There's an infinite number of ways to be useful to other people and to make a very good living doing that. You simply have to find out what other people want and give it to them cheaper or better or simply being the only one offering it. I had a boy in 1968 who made, he was 13, $68,000 a year. It was more than his mother and father put together and he made the second page of the Daily News, the whole page. What did he do? Well, he wanted some money. He followed this prescription of what do people need, and he lived in a 15-story apartment building. I live in a 13-story apartment building. Every building around was eight to 12 stories. He saw the difficulty with which older people had walking the dog every day or otherwise the dog goes inside. Plus, he learned from talking of the difficulty people have when they go away. Who's gonna feed the fish? Who's gonna burp the parrot? All these other things. There are a limited number of pet stores in New York City and they charge an arm and a leg to do that and they're not always that scrupulous. You know, I mean, you're out of sight, you're over in who knows where, and uh, you know, they throw the bone in the door and get out of there. Uh, so the kid taught himself first to walk more than one dog at a time, because you know, one of these buildings will have 60 dogs in it. And then he put out a competitive bid got some business, and that was it for his part of the dog walking. He became a broker for pet sitting and animal care. And who did he hire? He hired all the other kids who'd like to have a buck in their pocket who can't get work. He had no trouble having his, his choice. His, I had to give you his name. He was a Broadway producer 10 years ago. I don't know what he's doing. Brian Bantry is his name. There And when kids came to me, and uh, there's no kids in the room here now, can I say, and bitched, I mean, why did he get to do that? I said, no, wait a minute, there's 8 million people, or 15 million in the metropolitan area, there must be 20 million animals, and he's handling three or 400 of them. I mean, go to it. So, so if, if I might come back with a follow-up, what you're saying is that economic catastrophe is upon us, but what's really happening might be a chance for renewal because the entrepreneurial spirit may, in, in fact, spontaneously be necessary. Well, when you say renewal, that's probably accurate. It's a reversal back to the time of 1859, Abraham Lincoln spoke to the Wisconsin Agricultural Association. The British who had come in to pay for our westward expansion were saying, don't waste time on uh, the poor who live in 
you know, mud sill huts because they can't learn anything and they'll never be part of the world. And Lincoln said in his famous mud sill speech of 1859, which I took out of Richard Hofstetter's Main Currents in American Thought, I think, but certainly a Hofstetter book, he said, open your eyes and look around you. 75% of all Americans have an independent livelihood. And the other 25% are storing up a little bit of capital and they're aiming to have an independent livelihood. They're seamstresses and dog walkers and fishermen and loggers and they, they have independent livelihoods. They're engineers, they're small farmers. That's what the Amish never forgot. They're immensely prosperous. Their community's virtually crime free. It's drug free. The people are yeah, happy as pigs. They don't know what to do with all the money they have. And Amish said to me, in, uh, it was in uh, Western Ohio, it was at uh, the Second Luddite Convention, about half the attendees were, uh, were Amish, and he, he said to me, uh, he said, you'd have to be a damn fool to buy chemicals, they're so expensive, you can get double the results just by knowing how to farm. And another person who wasn't an Amish said to me, he lived among them, he said if the Amish wanted to build a moon rocket, they would. Wouldn't be difficult for them at all. They just think it's foolishness. Uh, we can return to a time when when we served each other rather than through the mediation of Philip Morris or Colgate or Microsoft. What, what are schools? A little louder. Um, what are schools like? Well, you want to get your librarian to dig up for you a Supreme Court decision rendered in 1976. It's Yoder versus the state of Wisconsin. When the state of Wisconsin demanded that the Amish go to school, they have no schools. Do they homeschool? No. What they have are people, and the people participate in a highly productive, very, very happy, insane community. And they learn whatever they need to know. They learn how to farm twice as good as the the government agriculture people. They're great mechanics even though, you know, they keep machinery at, at arm's length. There aren't any Amish schools until Yoder versus Wisconsin. So the, the federal government starts putting uh, pressure on the Amish and saying, you know, you'll go to jail if you don't send your kids to school. And they said that they would go to jail rather than send their kids to school. But the Supreme Court negotiated a deal between the Amish and the state of Wisconsin. And the deal is this, the Amish will send their kids to school for eight years, not 12 to eight. No Amish goes to college, it's a waste of time. It really is a waste of time. Uh, for eight years. Now, the Amish on their side said, we will accept the eight year prescription on, on these conditions, that no one, we will select all the people who are going to teach our children, that's one. Two, they have to have total sympathy and understanding of the Amish way of life. Three, school is over at noon, that's enough time for the nonsense. These kids have work to do. And the, the list of conditions was so sensible that it was like a pail of cold water. You know, because it, it wipes away the assumptions we have that simply aren't true. I know a guy in Philadelphia, and you know him too, but I'm not gonna mention his name, uh, but you know him. Uh, he runs an institute called the Institute for the Achievement of Human Potential and he runs workshops for parents in which he undertakes to teach parents how to teach their babies 
to read fluently how to teach their babies to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. So that by the age of five, the infant, I guess, is at five. By the age of five, the kid has enough intellectual machinery in place to, to undertake their own education largely in the future. And parents come from all over the world. I was in his, I called the guy because I heard about this. My daughter who went to MIT thought it was ridiculous. She, she said he's a laughing stock of the MIT dorm. And I said, well, wh what have you done firsthand to reach, oh, you don't need to, how to teach your baby to read, which by the way sold four million copies. None in this room, or to me, four million copies. Uh, I said, but how can you condemn this, this fellow without, oh, you don't need to. So I picked up the telephone, got his number out of Philadelphia information, called him up, he didn't know me from Adam, and I said, do you ever allow people to come out and watch uh, at work? And here's exactly what he said. What are you doing tonight? Uh, he said, come on, I got a spare bedroom. Come on out, you can, you can sit through a day here. Man was 77 years old. He said the teaching someone under the age of five to read is so simple that it's impossible to fail at it. And when he said that, it suddenly struck me that when I went to school at the age of five in Swissville, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh, the teacher came to, teacher had a rule that you could read as long as you didn't make a mistake. And we were in first grade, mind you. And I never made a mistake because I could read fluently when I went to school because my mother, who didn't have a high school diploma, taught me to read when I was about three. And by the time I was five, I was reading Matthew Arnold and other stuff, the daily newspaper, uh, and liking it, you know? I think anyone would. So she came to our home and demanded that I not be allowed to participate in the class because I was ruining her class because when he starts to read, he never makes a mistake. And now there are, uh, you know, no, no room for the other kids. So uh, the, the fellow's name is Glenn Doman, D-O-M-A-N. I, I don't know if he'd still be alive now. If he is, he, he is alive? Oh, the Institute's magnificent. When he took me, it's three mansions, big stone mansions, butted together on 8801 Stenton Avenue in, uh, in Chestnut Hill uh, section of Philadelphia. He took me in his library, which was about half as big as his theater, and all over the wall were tributes, not from any government agency, from Jackie Kennedy, saying that he had saved the life of uh, some niece that was considered feeble-minded. Winston, I mean, it's just everywhere. And he said, I offered my services to the Philadelphia school system for nothing. And they go around holding workshops saying that his name is never to be mentioned if you want a promotion and that he's like Satan come back in, you know, in Philadelphia clothing. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Doman, yes. Oh, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't do it. Oh, okay. but, I, but I'm not condemning it. I, I personally, aesthetically, w w would do it uh, uh, the uh, Francis Collins way. You know, whenever people are allowed to follow uh, their passion, eventually their passion takes in everything. So, I mean, I'd have kids who obsessively drew comic books there. And I said, you can do that. You don't have to read Shakespeare, but I am gonna impose some conditions on you. 
I want you to spend quite a lot of time during the school day at the public library learning something about graphic art so that the right hand won't be three times longer than the left hand, you know, or the head be as tiny as a pea on the big show. And I want you to learn about the history of graphic art. Then I want you to learn about what kind of inks and paper are used in the business, what the access routes to the business are, what the collateral uses of graphic art, which are many and much better paid than comic books uh, are, you can create a scholar out of anything. You could make the entire curriculum for a year, that ugly chair over there, <laughs> and never repeat yourself once. <clears throat> that must be a national company. Which state buys more of those chairs per capita? Is there some cultural reason why that's so? What color of chair is most popular and where? <coughs> What's a chair like that cost to make? Who's the, I mean you go on and on and on. I mean you're really only limited by your own imagination and as you push your imagination like a muscle, you know it grows. Um, did you confront or what was your like uh, <coughs> MO for dealing with colleagues? Great. Do it by modeling, leaving yourself? Great. Uh, first of all, it was the same as I told the kids. I said, this will disturb people if you know you're doing it a different way. So what you have to do is keep the lowest possible profile. If credit at, uh, accrues to any production uh, that goes on in this classroom, we shall give the credit to the principal, the superintendent, the librarian, who, and we got credit all the time. I mean, all the time. We were in the New York Times like once a week for one thing or another. Let me give you an example. It turns your whole life into a, a, a treasure hunt. Uh, I read that an epidemic of Japanese knotwood not weed, was sweeping Riverside Park and all the city parks. Well, Riverside Park was only two blocks from, three blocks from the school I taught in. And I also knew from a Japanese girl, famous uh, violinist who lives in my building, that J the Japanese think knotweed is a tremendous delicacy. I mean, they'll stoke as much knotweed as they can get down. Says, so well, how can this be a plague in Riverside Park, if it's a prized delicacy, why don't we get knotweed recipes, harvest the whole park from 72nd Street to Columbia University, and the knotweed, we'll put in big black bags, and with the recipes, I mean, we'll donate these bags and we'll cook some ourselves. Uh, there was a, a cultural reporter for the New York Times in the park when we descended on the park. Everybody had their own quadrant, and we had prizes for people who harvested the most knotweed. But you see, it, it wasn't a theoretical exercise. It, it, it was of use. If nothing you, your kids do, and, and, and I'll be sane about this, if most of the things your kids do add value to you, to your family, to the household, to the neighborhood, to the city, I guarantee you, you'll watch a transformation in your kids. You won't recognize them after 90 days. I mean, what they're used to doing is wasting their time, having their product consumed by someone who doesn't care about it all, and it gets thrown away. What if you thought like an animal trainer and you said, how will I discourage all the bells work and why they work that way? Why the tests? Why the constant interventions? It's a miracle if you can get through one school period without the, there's no kids in here, right? The goddamn loudspeaker interrupting the class three, four, five, seven times with absolutely irrelevant announcements that could have been put on a bulletin board if you didn't look at your, your faculty as if they were idiot children. 
I mean, someone, not someone, but I'm metaphorically someone, and they were all Prussians and Saxons, and there is one third, uh, and Hanoverian. They worked out how to train a human population like animals, starting with the young, and then those habits are murderous to break. You know, they keep spontaneously recurring, even when you think you've broken them. There. I mean, like it's fear. I mean, weren't they dealing with their defeat oh. by the French and they were trying to concentrate their power? This is a guy who knows some things. It happened, Prussia's main product was armies, renting soldiers out. And Napoleon's completely freeform armies, it's quite wonderful if you actually get into the minutia of how, how Napoleon did it. That idea that every foot soldier has the field marshal's baton in his was really true. Uh, when the French just kicked the, you know, the manure out of the Prussians at the Battle of Jena in 1806, right under the great German philosopher Immanuel Kant's window, <laughs> or so he said, the Prussians were in mortal crisis. You know, you didn't do that to a Prussian army. The Prussian army, check your Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition, the Prussian army could deliver five shots to their best opponents three. They were like machines. They marched into battle, twirling their rifles and doing trick marching drills just to impress the enemy. Then they'd deliver their five shots to the enemy's three. Then they'd fix the bayonet and finish the work. They weren't used to this freeform French army, you know, with its, with its uh, champagne and caviar and, uh, and, and its romantic music. It, it ruined the Prussian army. I mean, that's their chief export. Um, I'm going to have to interject for a second. Yeah. Um, at this point, what we'd like to do is we'd like to transplant everyone to the multi-purpose room. Oh. We're going to have a 15-minute oh. closing, and then after that, if you want to continue on the question, at that point, you have I'd to love to. I, I got a good event. <laughs> Thank you. God bless.